We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. saw a lot of people get paid yesterday, Mike. And specifically where I want to start is the edge group, man. The the edge defenders that hit free agency, all, a lot of guys got a ton of money. Shaq Bear, I think, was the biggest payday from an APY perspective, average per year at $17 million. But you saw Carl Lawson, Trey Hendrickson, Unique Ngakwe, Leonard Floyd coming in at 16, I think $16 million per year. You saw a lot of edge defenders get paid yesterday. What was your initial reaction to the edge class in free agency? My initial reaction is this is why you want to draft these guys in the first round, in the second round, and why in this class, you know, we had a question on a mailbag the last week, you know, why aren't we drafting slot corners in the first round? Well, it's because, or safeties in the first round, it's because you can have a top five, top 10 safety in the NFL and John Johnson make less than Nelson Aguilar, make less than uh, Romeo Aquara on the open market. And I actually like the Romeo Aquara deal given where the edge class is, but that's how coveted and that's how much these positions are paid. And that's why when you hit on one of them, you're saving yourself that much money against the cap that you can use then to go sign a safety that you know is good and you don't have to take the risk Mm -hmm. on it in the draft. And so if you are going to value those positions that we say are undervalued, I think free agency is where you want to do them. You want to go sign the John yes. Johnson of the world. You want to go sign the good, the Desmond Kings of the world, the Mike good Hilton. slot corners of the world. Yes, that's where you want to go covet those positions. Free agency, if you're talking about me having to pay Trey Hendrickson $15 million a year, some of these guys, what they're getting. And this is honestly even, I thought these numbers are coming in low. Even Yannick Ngakwe, like $13 million a year. These numbers are coming in lower than I thought and where the edge class had gone in recent years. Yeah. Joey Bosa has set the market at $27 mil a year. You have a lot of guys. You have guys like Frank Clark who are similarly tiered, in my opinion, to a lot of guys that came off the board in this edge class making over $20 mil a year. So I thought these were good deals. These were almost suppressed deals to where the market had been for a while at the edge class and are still pretty crazy on paper. I mean, here, here's positional value for you. And we had this conversation before we started recording. There's a difference between valuable positions on the football field that PFF sees as really valuable to winning football games. That's PFF war, wins above replacement. We like slot cornerbacks more than the market does those things. Then you have position value based on how much these guys actually get paid in the NFL marketplace. And I think that's where the edge is. Ro- Romeo Aquara is going to make more per year than the highest paid center in the NFL. Like That's why you don't draft centers early. You can get the highest paid center in the NFL for less than you can get Romeo Quara on the open market. Yeah. Like I think you you hit the nail on the head. The edge in free agency is hitting on the positions that are undervalued in some ways. Yeah. Like center, I would say in free agency, safety, slot corner. Go get those guys cheaper. John Johnson is going to make less than Nelson Aguilar. Like you said, $13 million a year for Nelson Aguilar, who's not even a number one receiver. And then you're getting John Johnson, who was the crown jewel of this safety class in free agency. For, and probably will be the highest paid unless Anthony Harris comes out of it with more money for $11 million APY. Like this, this is where the edges are. Like you have, I tweeted this earlier, draft valuable positions. I would say specifically quarterbacks, obviously pass rushers, offensive tackles early, or you're going to pay a Trey Hendrickson. Sorry, Mike Quinn, who's back in studio, by the way. You're going to pay Trey Hendrickson $15 million APY. Like that, and I keep saying APY and I hate it, but average per year, APY. that's what it is. APY. I, I do think a low-key winner from day one that no one's going to talk about as a winner from day one. You get these winners and losers. Winners are going to be the Patriots, the Jets, teams that went out and spent a lot, and we'll get to those in a second, breaking down their classes. But a low-key winner, in my opinion, from day one, is the Baltimore Ravens. They're going to get two compensatory picks back. They're going to get two fourth-round picks back from Matthew Judon, Yannick, and Gakwe. And they're still going to have a top-five defense next year because they have the best one of the best secondaries in the NFL. Those guys aren't going to make a lick of difference because of the way they operate and can still get a pass rush via the blitz and via 
the ability to hold up when the blitz doesn't get home because they have one of the best secondaries in the NFL and the way they're valuing certain positions still keeps them in that tier defensively because that's how valuable a secondary is. And, and they've proven that over the course of you know the past handful of seasons with their investment there. And the guy they signed, Kevin Zeitler, was a cut, so he doesn't factor into the compensatory picks. So they are, again, a team playing it smart that is going to pay off down the road in terms of long-term team building for them. One of those fourth rounders that they get back, probably going to draft another Matthew Judon because that's been their MO. They've been able to hit on those guys, the Pernell McPhee's, the Zadarius Smiths, and they've been raking in the compensatory picks for decades now. I mean, I think that's a perfect transition to talk about another team that was doing that similarly to the Baltimore Ravens, but has now completely flipped the <laughs> script. The New England Patriots went out on a spending spree, and in the beginning, you know, obviously the first move, the first domino to fall was the John New Smith signing. I think it was four years, $50 million, I think over $30 million in guaranteed money, more than George Kittle got in guaranteed money, more than Travis Kelsey got in guaranteed money. They went out and swung a big bat to go get John New Smith, and then they continued to do it. Judon, four years, $56 million. Jalen Mills, four years, $24 million. Nelson Aguilar, two years, $26 million. Kendrick Bourne, three years, $22.5 million. They went out and spent what was your initial reaction to this? I've seen Steve Palazzolo, who's from Boston, so let's let's you know couch this a little bit. Say you know they're spending like they have a rookie quarterback, and they do in some ways from a contract perspective. Cam Newton's not getting paid a ton of money, but are these signings even good? I know they're spending like they have a rookie quarterback, but where they're spending the money are these quality investments for the Patriots? Are they quote unquote back? Well, so they only have two guys currently on their roster: Shaq Mason, Jonathan Jones, who have a cap hit. Who are signed through 2022 with cap hit over five million dollars 2022 they got no like that is bottom of the nfl in terms of long-term big money deals on the roster so they had the space to do these deals these aren't things that are going to hamper them necessarily long term but it is a it is a distinct difference and i think it had to be a distinct difference because they are finally the team that is not drafting well they are finally in that tier of the Browns and the Jets and the teams that do this a lot of off seasons because those teams don't hit on picks for four straight years. And we don't hit on picks for four straight years. You got a lot of places that need to be addressed on your roster. And so that's basically what the Patriots are doing right now. Prioritizing tight end though, I think as we've seen kind of throughout NFL history, there's not a lot of needle movers. John Smith, I think he's a very good tight end. I don't think he's close to the Kelsey or the, uh, you know, that Waller, Kelsey, Kittle tier of tight ends. He's probably in the tier two, but the tier two is not near as valuable as any sort of number one or number two type of wide receiver, true guy at that position, a Will Fuller, a Kenny Galladay. Now these could still be in the market for one of those guys, but I think that's going to move the needle for you a lot more than the tight end. So spending big money on a tight end, we'll see how it goes. I will say the John Smith though, him getting that deal is why you draft athletic tight ends. Ran a four, six, two coming out 38 inch vertical legit athlete at the position. It's Tennessee was giving him handoffs. Those, it's because <laughs> those guys are dynamic and can develop into the receivers that actually win and beat man coverage and can go above and beyond the sort of scheme stuff that other tight ends normally produce on. And that's why they get those contracts. So if you're going to draft tight ends at any point in the draft, not just day one, day two, day three, draft athletes at the position or draft guys who can just purely inline block because drafting those – those guys who are, you know, four eight speed, they're just never gonna be you're never gonna be dynamic. When you add the context that they don't have anyone signed, you know, through twenty twenty two with a cap hit above five million, it makes it less egregious. I don't think you can call them out wholesale losers, but can I read these names and tell you how much they spent in guaranteed money? They spent close to, if not over, a hundred million dollars in guaranteed money on John Smith, Devon Gadcha, Matthew Judon, Jalen Mills, Nelson Aguilar, Kendrick Bourne, Dietrich Wise, and Henry Anderson. Over $100 million in guaranteed money to yeah. those guys. I just I know you don't have a lot of guys on the books. I just don't know if those were the guys that are turning the corner for you. I don't think their win total in 2021 from a Ve for Vegas odds even changes a half win or even a full win. Like This did not significantly improve their team. I don't mind their defensive line signings. Budget guys along the defensive line just being solid at that position, especially like in run defense. That's fine. We'll do that. It's the wide receiver signings because... Nelson Aguilar, Kendrick Bourne, I don't foresee as needle movers. Like Ke Nelson Aguilar, career year this past year, everyone's you know going on and on about how you know revamped, you know 
best year since whatever he had that one kind of breakout year at the Eagles, but like finally got back on track after being a first round pick, only 896 yards. Like he was not necessarily still a guy that you'd pay $13 million a year, similar range to what Corey Davis got. So I just don't, I don't, I don't think they're that much better. They made a ton, they made a ton of moves, added a ton of pieces. I don't foresee this team being that much better in 2021 yet. Yeah, now they can still get there. Obviously the draft, a big portion of that, but right now they've maybe moved their win total in my eyes, like one, one win. Maybe I foresaw them as like a seven and nine team prior to this six and 10 team, more like an eight and eight team now, but you're not, you're not competing in the ASC. That's for sure. And the transition originally to get to the Patriots was talking about how they're kind of following the Raiders lead here. This is, this is throwing the kitchen sink to go eight and eight. You know, this is like putting all your chips in to go eight yeah. and eight, nine and seven and not be a deep postseason contender. It's going to be interesting. Do you feel that the new England Patriots are still in the market to look to aggressively move up from 15 and get a rookie quarterback. I saw Steve Palazzolo tweet that out or say something along those lines saying, hey, they're spending big like they have a rookie quarterback. Maybe they're going to go up and get one and have Cam Newton with all those incentives sit the pine or compete for a starting job with, say, a Mac Jones, Trey Lance. I'm intrigued by the by the uh, opportunity, I'll say. It's interesting, like all these second day, Jesus. day two quarterbacks. I, I, I think they should. I think at this point, if you're – building out expensive pieces elsewhere in your roster. We say it all the time, the, the cheap quarterback. And if Cam Newton plays well, all of a sudden you got to pay Cam Newton again. But the cheap rookie quarterback is kind of that that holy grail. So I do think there'll be players in the quarterback market. This doesn't preclude them from that whatsoever. All right, can I can I jump to this? I will say game? it also, though, does bring up Bill Belichick, about to be 69 years old. He's kind of want one last hurrah. He no, I had that take on Clubhouse. I don't I think, think Bill Belichick's staying around. Uh, I, he I, might, I, it might not be too much longer there with him. I'll just say, I'll say it. This feels that like a shoot the moon it. situation. Maybe, and when you don't have the cards, if you guys don't play hearts, shooting the moon and hearts, it's a great game, by the way. Oh. I love nothing I love feels hearts. nothing more electric when you're secretly shooting the moon, dude. I've been they're, secretly they're shooting to. the moon my whole life. Um, all right, Texas. I, I wanted to pivot to this team, the Texans. I had this tweet last night, and I didn't. Even, I, I I ended up listing Marcus Cannon twice, which people highlighted. But also, I forgot to add like Terrence Brooks and a handful of other like bottom feeder signings. The Texans' additions so far this offseason, including trades, break it down for us. Mark Ingram, Christian Kirksey, Marcus Cannon, Justin Britt, Andre Roberts, KGH. I'm not pronouncing that last name. Terrence Brooks, Kevin Pierre-Lewis, Malik Collins, Chris Moore, Joe Thomas, not the tackle, the linebacker, special teamer. Justin McCray, and Shaq Lawson. They have added a lot of players, but man, they have not. that is not a single impactful starter at all. And how do you plan all these new guys to come in and gel immediately in, in, a, in, a, in a locker room that is completely dismantled with Deshaun Watson obviously wanting his way out? They, I mean, they added multiple guys who if they didn't sign with the Texans don't get signed by anybody, in my opinion. Yes, they cannot attract any big money free agent. There's just no one wants that. That's those. clear. Like they like they have not a lot of space either anyway to do it, but it, it does feel like a changing a, a, an intentional changing of the guard, but this is not there's no this isn't getting you anywhere. Like they, they just just draft a bunch of players at this point. Like trade back a bunch of guys and Get a bunch of young guys in there. That'll change. Get a bunch of guys in the draft that you feel like your good culture fits and then have them build it up through the bottom because this this is doing nothing for you. These are kind of just waste of money in my opinion. But we're bouncing they around have, a they little have bit. The need, so we'll see. We're bouncing around a little bit. And I think um you're going from some of the teams that we've kind of questioned some of their spending, the New England Patriots, Houston Texans. I want to go to a team that I think has been a winner in Frenzy, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Finding ways, restructuring contracts to get Shaquille Barrett back. Yes, at $17 million APY. I thought he was going to break the 20s, though. I thought Barrett was going to be able to ask for a $20 million average per year contract. He only lands at 17, which I don't even think places him inside the top 10 at edge defender in terms of average dollars per year. Took less to stay. Took less to and stay. That's, that's the sort of other edge that comes with having Tom Brady, having an elite quarterback, winning. People will take less to stay with you. People will, you don't have to go out and attract and it's, we'll get to, we'll get to how I feel about the Bengals here in a moment and their signings. But when you have a culture like that, that guys want to play for, 
guys will play for less. And Barrett, 82.0 pass rush grade 2019, 78.2 this past year, a quality pass rushing option for his price at only 28 years old. Absolute steal. And the fact that they said they're going to run it back, I didn't think that it was you know necessarily feasible. I was going to have to take some cap magic, and they made it happen. And yeah, they might be paying for it a little bit in a couple of years, but shit, who cares if you have another roster like this with Tom Brady in this window? Your window is not two years from now. You could, I don't think Bucks fans care if they go 0 16 in 2023 with this roster. They want to win another Super Bowl and it'll all be worth it. And that's basically what they've done here. And I applaud Jason Light wholesale. I mean, they've done it too without like one of the key dominoes I thought they'd have to make in, in either releasing or restructuring or extending Donovan Smith. Like Donovan Smith's like a $14 million cap hit in 2021. And I have, from what I've seen, I have not seen him restructure or get extended. So they're doing it without even moves that I thought were obvious ones. Tampa Bay doing some cap wizardry. And like you said, if it hurts them two, three years down the road, but they get another Super Bowl ring out of it, or, I mean, I think they're going to be right now the number two team in terms of favorites to go or win the Super Bowl behind the Kansas City Chiefs. Mm -hmm. And that's only because Patrick Mahomes is as good as he is. Like Tampa Bay in a prime position to run it back and be the Super Bowl um, uh, Super Bowl team for the NFC in 2020. I mean, there's probably Super Bowl favorites right now. If you had to put, obviously they won it last year, but there's reason. There's a lot of reason to believe that they should be better in 2021 than they were in 2020, at least throughout the course of the season. That doesn't assure you that you're going to win a Super Bowl, obviously, but super young secondary should develop. Obviously, everyone coming back that was an impact player outside of maybe Antonio Brown. We'll see what ends up happening with him. And then everyone was saying, wait till year two of Tom Brady in the offense. Wait till year two of Tom Brady in the offense. That's when it clicks in the Arians offense. So I think we'll see the offense could even be better this next year. All right, let's jump to something that didn't happen yesterday, but something over the weekend that we didn't have an opportunity to touch on. We were doing a ton of free agency stuff yesterday. Weren't able to record, obviously, the Monday podcast now recording on Tuesday, but Aaron Jones, him getting that contract from the Green Bay Packers contract, new contract for Aaron Jones, and you know, honestly preventing them from signing Corey Lindsley. I've seen some Green Bay Packers fans saying that Aaron Jones is more valuable than Lindsley. Lindsley goes to the Chargers, who I think were one of the sleeper winners of yesterday, getting Matt Filer and Corey Lindsley along the offensive line yesterday. For We'll see. We'll see, though. They, they, their O-line success. True. It, True. it always looks better on paper there than it does in I practice. I like Lindsley a lot, Chargers. though. I mean, yeah. And they didn't pay it out, you know, out, out their ass for Matt Filer. I mean, they needed to do something. Yeah. And I think they added pieces there. They didn't do what the Kansas City Chiefs did, adding Joe Tooney and making him the highest-paid guard in the NFL and likely putting themselves in a bind from a cap perspective with no offensive tackles. They released two... Starting yeah. caliber offensive tackles to add a guard, and that's a less valuable position. So I do think Lindsley was the better signing over Tooney. But back to the Aaron Jones contract, what's your opinion of this you know, new contract for Aaron Jones in Green Bay? Well, I will say about the Packers and the Lindsley deal, I had no, as a Packers fan, as you can see, I'm rocking the green and yellow today. Fingers crossed for a Wolf Fuller signing. I think we get one today. Well, how, do, what do we, how do we feel about that? But they have been, they have been maybe the single best offensive line scouting team in the NFL over the past – decade plus and you just go back to josh Sitton, tj lang david bakhtiari Corey lindsley the earliest one was a third rounder of that bunch i want to say i think that was lang those are four blue chip type offensive linemen that you did not spend draft capital on to build the offensive line throughout the years elton jenkins now more recently obviously brian balaga back was a first rounder but they have been exceptional at that position so i trust them and they have had a good track record of knowing when to let guys go there. So, no problem with that. The Aaron Jones one, I only really have an issue of it with it if it precludes them from addressing the obvious need that I keep talking about, that I'm sick of talking about, and the wide receiver. So, that's the really only issue I have with it because, yeah, four years, $48 million. I'm guessing the way it's going to be structured is super low cap hit this year. It's only $12 million guaranteed. So, super low cap hit this year modest cap hit probably somewhere in the 12 to 13 million dollar range in 2022 and then they could probably cut them with some maybe four or five million in dead cap heading into 2023 is what i think it's going to be because that's kind of just the way a four-year 48 million dollar deal with that little guaranteed money that's how i would imagine it's set up and good on aaron jones for like getting it but i just think there's 
the offense like teams have realized they were not going to pay shell up big money for Aaron Jones. He was not going to get it elsewhere. And so this keeps him. Everyone's saying you could have got him for eight million dollars in the cap or on the franchise tag. This is going to keep the cap hit lower this year. And I I will like the deal if it allows them to then still go out and be players in this wide receiver class. Yeah, I think you saw rumors that the Green Bay Packers are interested in every receiver that's available, trying to get another receiver to pair with Devontae Adams. And I think the other thing, too, I was talking to Brad Spielberger, who is, I think, based in New York, but he's out here in Cincinnati for free agency. And he was saying that the way it's structured and with the guaranteed money, it's closer to a $9.5 million APY for Aaron Jones. And it comes back to what I said before, drafting running backs in the first round. Let's talk about it. You can get Aaron Jones, the best running back of this free agent class, for with the guaranteed money included, close to $9.5 million average per year why in the hell would you spend a first round yeah. pick on a running back because if you do that and then you find yourself needing a pass rusher you're going to end up signing leonard floyd for 16 million dollars per that is the problem that is the positional value conversation full stop and I, that maybe that's the last one i'll bring it up but i'm really frustrated with i saw someone say you know take position of value with a grain of salt it's like what are you talking about that, that, that's like taking that's like taking like car value with a grain of salt. Hey, like, you know, Honda's, you know, less valuable than Mercedes, but take that with a grain of salt. It's like, no, that is what the market is. Yeah. Mercedes are more valuable than Hondas. You know, fucking edge rushers are more valuable than running backs. I'm sorry. So why would you take first round picks, cost controlled contracts at lower value positions? I'm sorry. That's my last rant. I'm sorry, Quinn. If you're upset in there too, I'm not trying to rile any feathers, man. I'm not trying to rile and, any feathers. And I, I've said it probably a zillion times that, but the draft can be a long-term decision or should be a long-term decision. It should be. If you're drafting well, that guy should be on your team for a decade. There is one running back under contract right now that was drafted with his team before 2016. Quinn, do you know who it is? Giovanni Bernard. Nice. Giovanni Bernard. Yeah. <laughs> the only one. And he might get cut here soon. The only one drafted before 2016. Five years. It's five years. One running back's been with their team for more than five years. That's, re that's, re that's not like a long-term decision then when you're drafting a running back. All right, let's jump to the New York Jets. They've made some power moves yesterday. Added Corey Davis, wide receiver from the Tennessee Titans for three years, $37.5 million. Obviously, added Bengals' favorite, Carl Lawson. Three years, $45 million, I think $30 million in guaranteed money. And then, you know, some people hated on this signing. Like, I think it's a one-year deal worth up to $7 million for Jared Davis, yeah. former first-round pick. And I know, like, they don't have a lot of good linebackers there. Robert Salah could get the best out of Jared Davis, and maybe that's a top 30 linebacker in the NFL. Yeah. We'll see. But I didn't hate the deal as much as other people did. Uh, I, I will say, if you think that we here as draft analysts don't give up on our prior opinions on players coming out in the draft and won't give up, Jared Davis, maybe the worst linebacker in the NFL over the past four years, still gets a $7 million contract. NFL teams don't give up on their on their college evals either. They probably, Salah probably saw him coming out, probably was high on him, probably wanted him, didn't end up getting him, now he gets his chance. That's, we're not the only ones, I'll just say. It's human nature. So, I that one, I whatever, $7 million isn't a huge hit. Yeah, I, I kind of like the other two. They're not super long deals. They're not super massive. They are where I would have valued those two players. I, I think Carl Lawson was quite possibly the best edge rusher available in this draft class. I have a theory about this. Sign edge rushers who come from bad teams, who, who, who have most recently played on bad teams. Because when you're on a bad team, when you're losing a lot of games, you don't have the ability to rack up sacks in the fourth quarter when you know the other team has to pass. You just don't. And so when you're Carl Lawson, and that's over the last, you know, basically your entire career there in Cincinnati, you've never gotten a ton of favorable pass rushing situations because you've been down every fourth quarter. You've been the team getting run on. You go to a situation where it's flipped, kind of like Shaq Barrett going to the Bucks. All of a sudden, you have a lot of opportunities to rush the passer, and you're the guy racking up sex. And his efficiency stats have been lights out when he is a pass rush, when he has gotten the opportunity to rush the passer there with Cincinnati Bengals. In my opinion, the Bengals letting him walk to sign Trey Henderson was the single worst deal I saw in free agency day one. Dude, you're just dragging Quinn through the coals right Sorry, now. You're only doing it because he's back in studio. No, that was, that's just the sign of bad organizational decision making. Because retaining talented players builds a better, it's like if you want to build a culture, have the Bucks culture where guys want to stay. Reta where you're going to retain your guys, where that's what you want to do is keep your guys in house, not where you're going to let a guy leave to pay a guy identical money at the same position because you're haggling over guaranteed money at that point. That is 
just a bad business process that's going to lead to bad results and let and have bad culture in your locker room. And, and the Jets are obviously the bene- beneficiaries here. It's a new day, though. New stripes. New stripes. Okay, I want to stay on the Jets just for a little bit longer. Yeah. You saw some rumors that Pete Carroll would be interested in Sam Darnold via trade. Do you think the moves they made yesterday pushed us in any clearer direction in terms of what they want to do with the number two overall pick? Do they want to add a quarterback? Are they building around Sam Darnold? Their social team hasn't said a new weapon for Sam Darnold. I was hoping for that because I think that would have been good banter. Do they have the Sam is our guy quote from Robert Salah? Not yet. I don't know if it's that that's happened yet either. But do you think the Jets... Uh, do, do any any change in draft draft decision making for the Jets here? I mean, you can love Sam Darnold if they're trading with the Jets. They're trading for the number two overall pick to then draft a quarterback. I would think so. No, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I'm just going to say that I think that's. I'm sorry, far fetched. I'm sorry. All right, no, it's but, fine. Let's jump. I, to, I saw um, the report too, and it's it's electric content if it does happen. Yeah, yeah. But God damn, that would be an all time blunder. Uh, all time, like John Schneider can't. You can't. You can't do that. Urban Meyer of the Jacksonville Jaguars went out and went out to attack depth. I feel like he added a lot of depth players here. He had Roy Robertson Harris for three years, twenty-four point four million, fourteen million guaranteed. Jamal Agnew, core special teamer, three years up to twenty-one million dollars. Dwayne Smoot, two years, fourteen mil. Carlos Hyde, former Ohio State Buckeye, two years, six mil. Rayshon Jenkins, former safety of the Los Angeles Chargers, four years, thirty-five mil, with sixteen mil guaranteed. Some interesting signings from the Jacksonville Jaguars and Urban Meyer. Yeah, interesting. Being a positive word. It's a word there. Um, I don't quite get it. Now, for like I said, for a few million more, you could have gone out and got a John Johnson. Like you're there. I I respect the budget approach to free agency. Don't go out and break the bank. That's why I was saying to do if you're the Jags or the Jets. I don't think the Jets really broke the bank either with their deals. Those are fairly modest by what other guys are getting on the market like Leonard Floyd got four years 64 for the Rams in the edge market and you got Lawson for 345 like those are solid deals they're not going to be strapped long term with the deals they made and and the Jags I thought to do a similar thing don't hamper yourself long term don't cake your pants as it were and they didn't but they also didn't get better like Roy Robertson here 67.0 overall grade last year I think that was highest of his career Rayshon Jenkins 68.9 overall grade highest of his career you got guys who can see a football field. I don't know if they make a difference. Dewan Smoot was kind of one of the least efficient pass rushers in the NFL over the course of his career there with the Jaguars. Carlos Hyde, I mean, you fucking know what Carlos Hyde is. That one's purely just Urban Meyer reuniting with his boy, um, maybe doing him a favor at this point in his career. So I, I, I don't really see why, but they made the deals. <laughs> They happen. I don't know. They're just like that. Those are not needle movers. That's all. Yeah. That's how I feel about. I these mean, deals. similar to the Houston Texans, but the Houston yeah. Texans didn't spe- spend more than five million dollars on any one of those yeah. guys. <laughs> the Houston Texans brought in a lot of guys on like two, one year, two million dollar deals to flesh out depth and improve the culture. Um, uh, I know you want to jump next to the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, they gave some monster money to Joe Tooney, made him the highest paid guard in the NFL. And I know a lot of Bengals fans were pretty upset. Like, man, we had to get a blue chip like Tooney, but. Giving him $16 million a year and the guaranteed money for a guard, like I, that is a lot of ch- cash. And Joe Tooney, it's going to be very difficult for him to live up to that value. But Kansas City Chiefs, with no tackles at all, go for guard. I was going to say, that's the thing. They went in, free agency. We don't have much space, don't have much to work with. We need two tackles. They get one guard. Like, yeah, they need a guard, too. Yeah, they need a center, too. But I think that's the thing. It kind of ignores what how we feel about offensive line play and what you can get by with and how it's a weak link proposition to where you're only as strong as your worst offensive lineman and it's difficult to necessarily protect one offensive lineman and you know a tackle you can chip but that's going to really hamper your offense if you have five guys that are average across the board it's much much better than having three guys that are elite two guys that are trash they are very much going to be looking at an offensive line next year that is more like the latter that I said, maybe two or three guys that are very good and a couple guys that are trash than five average across the board. And that's concerning, in my opinion. Because, yeah, you could take advantage of a a strong tackle class in the draft. I I think that's pretty much everyone's going to have them penned in to one of those guys in their mock drafts at this point. But 
you're still going to have a massive hole somewhere. You're still not going to have a quality offensive line despite the massive contract you gave to me. And now they have seven guys, seven guys making 14 plus million a year. The Rams, everyone said the Rams are going for a top heavy approach. They only have six, seven guys. They're really, and yeah, Patrick Mahomes can cover up a lot of it, but you're banking on guys, one, not declining when you pay them that much. And two, not getting hurt when you're that reliant on only those guys to be your impact guys. And then seeing what you can, put together with your rookie classes you're really reliant on those seven guys not getting hurt yeah you have to stay healthy that was the other thing it's like joe Tooney, when i say it's gonna be hard to live up to that contract like he has to also stay healthy like he has to play 800 plus snaps a season across this deal yeah. to really deliver on that value i also think that you see now that chiefs are still in the market for trent williams there's no way right there's no way they can bring in trent williams well if they do they are going to be against it not this year but next year mm-hmm. i mean they are going to be living on a prayer that's like the next big situation. domino to fall you have kenny galladay who i think is the highest ranked free agent still not available when we're recording this at 9 23 a.m on tuesday and also trent williams and then i think anthony harris hunter henry those are some of the big names still available in free agency i want to jump now and get your full fleshed out opinion on the los angeles chargers they yeah. say, I, I like the two deals that they did make Corey lindsey five years 62.5 million dollars uh, at center they also signed matt filer offensive lineman who could play guard or tackle three years 21 mil and then this one kind of got brushed on the rug i don't love this signing Michael Davis, cornerback, three years, 25.2 yeah. mil with 15 mil guaranteed. I, 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 that one came out of the blue for me. I didn't expect Michael Davis to get paid that fat. Yeah, starting towards the end of last year. Uh, I guess you want to, like I said, I, I, I'll not blame a lot of teams for retaining their own players. If you have a guy in house, like that's good business to keep your guys in house as much as humanly possible. And like I said, it builds good culture. So, it's not a massive deal to retain a guy, a cornerback, who has shown some flash over the course of his career. The two off-the-line signings had to happen. We'll see. that The Lindsley one is the man's about to turn 30, had some injury issues this past year. It hasn't necessarily been the biggest pinnacle of health over the course of his career. It has been hurt at times. I, I just, this feels like a guy who's going to play 250 snaps in a charged uniform before he's cut. No. It just feels like it. That's like, because that's their M.O., that's just their MO, sadly. But I hope it's not. I hope For the six Chargers fans that are alive, plug your ears. I hope I I truly hope it's not because I would love to see what Justin Herbert could do with some actual pass protection, actually being kept clean in an offense. But I want I it just, too, because they, they, they've been penciled in for yeah. Rashawn Slater at 13 for a while. You had Slater I think they with still Filer, do. with Lindsley, and proved that, that off line interior. significantly. Yeah. And then the, all this regression talk about Justin Herbert not being as good under pressure. What if he's not under pressure as often? And mm-hmm. he's thrown from a clean pocket more. That's going to help. Yep. That doesn't regress. Your ability to play from a clean pocket doesn't regress nearly as much as your ability to play under pressure. And if you have more clean pockets... You're more often than not going to have more production or better production at the quarterback position. Um, jumping to the New Orleans Saints, some interesting moves. Dude, both these moves were graded according to PFS Deal Grader, which you can check out on pff.com. And if you do, use promo code FREEAGENCY30 to save 30% off any PFF subscription. But James Hurst, above average deal, three years, nine mil, only five million guaranteed. And James Hurst isn't like a world beater, but that I definitely think increases the floor, increases the depth of your offensive line. And then you got a guy who's um, kind of par with what's his face gosh what the panthers did for the offensive lineman for a lot less yeah well they had, they brought in cameron irving cameron and irving and gosh the jets uh paddle flying pad Pat Pat yeah yeah um but the other move the new orleans saints made and this was graded as elite according to pff.com was Jameis winston on a deal worth up to 12 million not even going to be guaranteed 12 million i think he's on the books for more than what cam's supposed to make i think yeah. his base salary is more than what cam yeah. is supposed to make this one was writing was on the wall. I mean, he was going to stay there. He took less to go there in the first place because he wanted to be the quarterback of the future of the Saints. He wanted to learn Sean Payton. We'll see if he starts over Taysom Hill now, but this one like the, was the one deal you thought the Saints would be able to get done this offseason. All right, jumping to the San Francisco 49ers. I thought they made some interesting moves here. Five years, $27 million contract to Kyle Juszczyk, the fullback, $10 million in guaranteed money. Also brought back Jason Verrett, one year, $5.5 million. He was one of what? They, Richard Sherman and Kwan Williams were also free agents, and Akella Witherspoon. So they had to bring back one of their cornerbacks. Jason Verrett is the guy betting on himself again, I think is what he said, one year, $5.5 million. And they also signed Samson Ebukam, two years, $12 million. Opinion on the San Francisco 49ers decisions. 
Yeah, getting for right back is huge. Yeah. Because, I mean, in terms of quality, how good he is when healthy is worth triple that, I'll say, on the open market. Like, should be realistically worth triple that. But no one's going to take that chance because of his health over the course of his career. Just the fact that he was the first time he's ever stayed healthy was 2020. So, yeah, a great deal for them because, like I said, the sort of risk reward there about as big as any deal signed yesterday. All right, only a handful more teams here, and then I want to touch on some of the best remaining and get some landing spots in before the end of the podcast here. But Tennessee Titans were big players. They 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 paid some money, man. They they shelled out some cheddar. Danico Autry, three years, $21.5 million, $9 million guaranteed. I'm a big Danico Autry fan. Going back to his time at the Raiders, he is one of the more productive interior players that also has a lot of gap versatility. I think Danico Autry is a good signing there. They also brought in Bud Dupree. Five years, $82.5 million, $35 million guaranteed, coming off an ACL injury, and honestly, just not a lot of pure pass rush wins. Like, yes, he had sacks, yes, he had pressures, but man, he was not winning as a pass rusher in one on one situations at the rate of a Carl Lawson, at the rate of even Trey Hendrickson. Trey Hendrickson had a higher pass rush win rate, Quinn, than Bud Dupree last year. Like, that's where we're at. Uh, with him and then those were kind of the two big splash plays the Titans made while also letting Corey Davis and Johnny Smith walk I would say so I had that theory about edge rushers coming from bad situations bad teams where they're not having a lot of leads Bud Dupree's kind of the opposite he came from about as good a situation as you could possibly have to rush the passer in the NFL in the fact that he had four other guys along that defensive line three or four other guys at any given moment who are all dominating in their own right. Like you're, you're playing across with TJ Watt. You're not going to draw any sort of double team, any sort of attention from opposing defense. You had a lot of leads, obviously, over the course of your career with the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, and how they how good they've been over his time there. And it's coming off an ACL. You got a lot of strikes against you to be shelling out that big money deal, but the desperation for edge talent, I mean, this is a better deal still than signing Vic Beasley. You know? Like, it's better than that. But this is still... The amount of money they're giving them and guaranteed with like the the unknown here of him and the ACL injury and him playing anywhere other than Pittsburgh is not the deal I would have done. All right, last deal that's already happened before I talk about some landing spots. Ryan Fitzpatrick, quarterback of the future of the Washington football team, competing with Taylor Heineke for the starting job. Apparently, I think I saw Rappaport tweet this out, that he is going in as the starter for the football team, but I think Heineke can, still can compete uh, for the starting position. I love the move because I love Ryan Fitzpatrick, and he's just hashtag fun to watch. I'm sorry, he is. But is this not the move we told him to kind of avoid in that this is going to put you in that position where you're a nine-win team that's winning the NFC East but not going deep in the postseason? I don't think so because... They were going to be that anyways. Like they, they were they won the NFC East last year with dog shit at quarterback. Like they they could make they could get to ten and six. I don't think you're winning a Super Bowl with Ryan Fitzpatrick, but he has had some high end games. Like a three a three game stretch. I wouldn't put it past him if you really are if you really can build out that Dude, roster. Ryan we, Fitz, you wouldn't put past Ryan Fitzpatrick winning a Super Bowl. Have you seen? I mean, what was that three years ago, Week One when he outdueled Drew Brees yeah. in the Superdome? Dude, that was pass one of the best. against the Raiders it was, was like honestly one electric. of the coolest passes I've seen over the last decade. Yeah. Where he's got his face just getting ripped off and he throws it a seed. I mean, his high end games are elite, elite. I could see him putting it together a Nick Foles run. Now, is it a, a, a good chance? No. Is it a better chance than Alex Smith? Hell yes. yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's a better chance of Taylor Heineke. Heineke either. So if, and if, if Foles and Flacco can do it, exactly. Fitzy That's, can do it. He is right They better on add some those. talent around them then. I need yeah. more than just Terry McLaurin. I saw the no, fantasy but, football community so excited about Ryan Fitzpatrick going to Washington because he actually pushes the ball downfield. Yeah. Like he throws the ball downfield. He is aggressive. Yes, he throws picks, but like he actually pushes the ball downfield. Now Terry McLaurin could get a, actual downfield targets. And that's the other thing. In terms of pure fan enjoyment, you go from maybe the least enjoyable quarterback in the NFL to watch Alex Smith. <laughs> like you will punt so much with Alex Smith. You're not going to punt with Ryan Fitzpatrick. Yeah, it'll get picked, but picks are fun to watch too. Yeah. Like I, I still remember, you know, no one more fun to watch in the NFL history than Brett Favre because something was going to happen. Mm -hmm. it, it might not always been good, but it wasn't going to be sacks. It wasn't going to be checkdowns. It wasn't going to be throwing the ball away. Ball was going to be. And it's always more fun when that's the case. They would have two 30 for 30 quarterbacks in two seasons if they won a Super Bowl. Alex Smith's 30 for 30 comeback story. Fitzy, oh you'd God. have to do a 30 Yo. for 30 on his Super Bowl run. And when it comes to that, because that'd be good. 
Washington be entertaining. football team fans oh, yeah. just want to have a fucking good time next year. Okay. They weren't, they made, if Washington's front office wasn't willing to, you know, mortgage the farm to go up and get the third or fourth best quarterback in this class, getting Ryan Fitzpatrick and giving the Washington football team, social media team and the fans, something fun to watch every single week where, fo- where he's not going to be battling for a young rookie like Tua Tunga Bailoa. He was in Miami. I mean, I'm all for it. And this, the NFC East with Dak Prescott, I think the Dallas Cowboys should be the favorite to win, but could be an exciting run for Ryan Fitzpatrick, Terry McLaurin. If they can go out and get Kenny Galladay or Will Fuller too, like I, I'm, I'm starting to get interested. I'm starting to get excited about Fitzmagic in D.C., nation's capital, where he belongs, ninth team in his career for Ryan Fitzpatrick. All right, let's close the podcast with this. Just highlight a handful of the names that are still available as of now. Obviously, all of this analysis could be bunk when they sign with a new team, but I want to look at ideal landing spots for some of these guys, starting with Kenny Galladay. Where do you think Galladay has the most success if a team does sign him, that's a good question. When a team signs him, not if a team signs him. Bengals. No, not it's, the Bengals. He's not coming. To the no. I, 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 so the two favorites right now, from what I'm hearing, are the Miami Dolphins and the New York Giants. I don't like the Miami Dolphins fit at all. He is redundant to Devontae Parker. I agree. And Preston Williams in some ways. What was the other one you said, sir? Uh, New York Giants. I like the Giants fit. I think that's what I said yesterday. And I still feel that way about the Giants fit. Because they really, they don't have that type of wide receiver on their roster. That is not what Sterling Shepard is. It's not what Darius Slayton is. Uh, so I do think that that would be where I would think he ends up. I still like Jacksonville. I mean, I think Jacksonville trying to get a, a big cool piece at receiver. I about really the, want that. How about getting duped by the Jacksonville trade rumor? CJ Golson got me. <laughs> that was so fun, though. I mean, that that's what free is all about. That's what scrolling through Twitter and refreshing is all about. Um Number two, Trent Williams. He's the second-ranked free agent, free agent still available. I'm still holding out hope that the Indianapolis Colts throw throw $20 million average per year in a contract at Trent Williams so he could play alongside Quentin Nelson. And while the yeah, ceiling of be- that team with Carson Wentz is relatively low compared to like even going, you know, going to some of these other teams, and I know the Chiefs are in the mix as well, I still think that would be hashtag fun to watch if Trent Williams went out there with Quentin Nelson. I would love to see Trent Williams next Quentin Nelson. That double team combo, all time. Yeah. Truthfully, like the, the, maybe maybe the best all time because that's how good Trent Williams is. I think he's pretty, I don't want to say locked in as a Hall of Famer, but he is a Hall of Fame caliber offensive tackle. Mm-hmm. Quentin Nelson is at a Hall of Fame pace at left guard. Trent Williams obviously still in his prime was the top great left tackle in the NFL last year. So that would be fun to watch. All right, Hunter Henry. I, Steve said this, and I can't get it out of my head. I think the best for him is Jacksonville. Go to Jacksonville where they don't have any good tight end talent. Tyler Eifert, I think, is a free agent or might as well be. Not a difference maker at the position. And you just want, want you just want to give Jackson. Trevor Lawrence more weapons. And I know Hunter Henry is not friend, like, right? Yeah, it's a quarterback. Security best blanket. Friend. Security blanket. Hunter it's, Henry. What? Why not? Why not Hunter Henry to Jags? Get a, get a wide receiver. Okay. I mean, shit. Like, I think he's not going to cost that much money. Hunter Henry's, Hunter gonna, Henry's not going to make a lot of money. You don't think so? No. He's going to get Austin Hooper money. You think? At least. He's better than Austin Hooper. Austin Hooper got like $12 million a year, right? Or what about the injury stuff? $12 million a year. If that's the market we're getting in, John New Smith money. His numbers are much better than John New Smith's over his career. He should at least be asking for that. If that's where you're having to pay him, when you could get, not a Nelson Aguilar, but like Corey Davis for a similar amount, where you can get likely Will Fuller, maybe Curtis Samuel for that amount, go get Curtis Samuel instead if you're the Jacksonville Jaguars. Pair him back with, bring the Ohio State gang back together there. Yeah, maybe you're right. I don't know. I, I, anything over 10, 11 million for Hunter Henry, I start to get a little upset about it as well. Like, that's a lot of money for a guy that just has all this talent, but his full stop not been that productive. Like, he has not been that productive in his NFL career, his battled injuries, all those well, things. Well, it's a tight end position because yeah. back to what we say, they're not needle movers. It's not going to do that much for you. The Austin Hooper deal, I think they have regrets about that one themselves. So, yeah. All right. Will Fuller. Everyone has been mocked. Or I guess mocked is probably not Fucking the right word. But I think he's going. I'm wearing the green and gold today, baby. You think you're going to go Green Bay for Will Fuller? If he does, I'll just give me Will Fuller or Golden Tate. I want to run back Notre Dame, my glory days. Dude, that would be sick. I think Green Bay is the best landing spot for Golden Will Tate's Fuller. my favorite Notre Dame player of all time, hands down. He's the way he played the game of football was fucking awesome. When he trolls guys, when he like has a known touchdown, and, oh. yeah. The one time his he did pre end zone sellies are fantastic. <laughs> Elite. No one could touch him. No. The time he did a front flip into the end zone when the guy was about to tackle him was like, there's that whole supercut of him doing all those celebrations. It's 
electric. Russell Wilson's favorite Notre Dame player of all time, too. Oh, yeah. Isn't there the rumor about Golden Tate? I don't know it. Okay. Shouldn't say that. <laughs> well, Russell Wilson punched him in the locker room, though, or something. Oh, right? really? Or oh, was wow. it no, Earl Thomas punched him in the locker room? Someone punched him in the locker room. But. Sounds like he's living the dream. All right, a handful of names here, and then we'll close out the pod. Get to the interviews with Tal Noah Hufanga and Eric Stokes Jr. of Georgia. William Jackson, I can't get the New England Patriots fit out of my head. I do think the Patriots, though, they've already spent over $100 million guaranteed. They Going and getting William Jackson could be could be the move. They got more. Uh, I mean, they can go out and get William Jackson. I, I think that's – now they already went Jalen Mills, which is one gonna play of my safety, least favorite. Though. Yeah, I mean, it's a different position, but you're already adding to the secondary. But that's the thing. It's you have guys about to come off the books. I think the McCourties are about to come off after this year. Gilmore is going to come off after this year. That's a big chunk of your secondary. It would not surprise me if they went that route. Last name here I'll bring up, and then we'll get out of here. Juju Smith-Schuster. He's been rumored to the Raiders. I've seen Jets. Where does Juju Smith-Schuster actually have some success? No, I mean, he's not that good. He's just straight up not. He's okay. He's here. I had the conference day. He's a poor man's Jarvis Landry. It's not a poor man's you want to be. You yeah. Don't, you don't want to be that pure underneath threat, especially when I don't think he's as dynamic after the catch as Jarvis Landry. So doesn't have as good of ball skills either, right? I mean, would you put Juju in the same tier as Landry from a ball skills perspective? No. Uh, so he's a poor man's across the board. Jarvis that's Landry. what I'm saying. Like he really is poor man's Jarvis Landry, and that to me is not. I'm trying to think of even like a best fit where he really could go and produce. He's a number three, in my opinion. Yeah. Steven, yeah, okay, some of people two. have said he's a number two at best. I don't, I don't want him as my number two. You know, if I'm going to bring him in, I want him as my number three at most mm -hmm. to hit, for him to compete from the slot and not draw a ton of attention. Because I mean, I don't think it's all this. I also think quarterback play in Pittsburgh has tailed off. But when Antonio Brown left, like his efficiency metrics dropped, and I don't his his on target percentage from Big Ben did not drop significantly. He still ran deeper routes. Some people say, oh, he was running a lot of underneath stuff. He ran deeper routes in the two years after Antonio Brown and still had a lower average depth target because he just wasn't winning downfield. It's uh, it's interesting with the with the uh, Juju Smith-Schuster conversation. I think Pittsburgh's smart to let him walk, though. Like, I don't think paying yeah, they him got more big than money. Talent. I mean, you've got Chase Claypool's emergence. You have uh, James Washington. You have Deontay Johnson. Like, you got a, you got a solid three right there. You don't need Juju. All righty. Can we actually finish with your favorite and least favorite move from day one? Yeah, I mean, I already said my least favorite move. It's the Carl Lawson move to let him walk and sign Trey Hendrickson. It's like, yeah, I get the money's different to some degree, but it's not that much different if you want them to play out their entire contracts, which I think you should be making free agent signings. I have a big take on that. Like, if you're making free agent signings and already planning to get out of the deal, that's that's not a good sign. And I think that's kind of how the Bengals treated the Hendrickson deal. They're making it with the out in mind, whereas the Carl Lawson deal, they're kind of locked into three years with him. I think my least favorite move, and it's going to be a pair of moves, is the New England Patriots throwing money to start Nelson Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne at wide receiver. Yeah. I just, and and then obviously pushing Nikhil Harry down the depth chart. There's rumors that he'll get traded. That's, I mean, who's going to trade for? It's going to be Jacoby Myers, Julian Edelman at 35, 36 years old, Kendrick Bourne, and Nelson Aguilar. That is not a good receiving core. I'm sorry. And you have John Smith, and I get that, but I still don't think that's another thing, too. With John Smith, you sign him to, you know, four years, $50 million. Two third round picks at tight end and Dalton Keene and Devin Asiasi are just done. Like mm -hmm. you're they're depth players at this point. You're not gonna run a ton of twelve personnel with Dalton Keene and Devin Asiasi opposite of Johnny Smith, especially after signing Nelson Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne. I I I think those are my least favorite moves because I just don't understand this roster building strategy from the New England Patriots. I don't think this moves the needle enough for them not to just end up in quarterback purgatory again. Anthony Tresh wrote the article for PFF.com. It's locked to subscribers. Use promo code free agency thirty to read it if you don't have a subscription. Thirty percent off. But he, he talks about how like this really does cement them in this quarterback purgatory situation. Unless there's obviously a range of outcomes where Cam Newton like really shows up, but the most likely outcome is that they do finish eight, nine wins, don't make a deep postseason run, and are in the same position again next year, picking between 15 and 20 without a good quarterback and a bad roster. Yeah, obviously there's still like some time left this offseason to change that, but it's a possibility. I don't know. I still believe in Cam Newton. He really had dog shit there to throw he did, to. He did. And he had COVID. And they won so seven we'll games. See. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, I think my favorite move, though, it's the, I think it's the John Johnson one. Like That's what we said. That's an undervalued position. That's a guy who's going to provide – more value than that number, that $11 million per year number. He is just going to be more impactful to your team. If he's anything like the guy we've seen every single year of his career, every single full season, coverage grade over 80, 
that's incredible consistency at the safety position. Um, yeah, I think that's quite easily my favorite deal. My favorite move, I think, was the decision for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or the execution, really, to get all those contract restructures done to bring back their guys, yeah. to to establish that culture. And like you, you, we don't speak to culture a lot on this podcast, but you, you talk a lot about letting your guys walk and what that does to a locker room, what that does to a culture. Tampa Bay and Bruce Arians, literally like the parade of the Super Bowl saying, we're bringing you all back, bringing David, Godwin, and Barrett back. It's big news. And, and Gronkowski. Like, they're able to get Gronkowski back as well. And I know he's not as big of a needle mover as some of those other guys. But, like, th that's legitimate. Like, that is very, very good. That's a very good way to maintain your locker room and those things. Yeah. And it's not just you can let guys walk. I'm not saying don't ever let anyone walk. But it's more the to then sign someone else. Yeah. Right there at the same position that offseason. Like, to bring in a guy's replacement from elsewhere. If you're letting a guy walk, you should have... It's because your backups are good. It's because you've been drafting well, and those are the guys who are going to come up and take his spot. It's not because you want to then go sign his replacement yeah. right after that and have a new guy rolling through that door. We didn't want Carl Lawson at edge. We wanted Trey Hendrickson at edge at the same price point. Like that, yeah. again, uh, you're right, does not – that does not give the locker room in Cincinnati a ton of Yeah, you know, it's like you just, you're just another defensive end there or you're def like a defender who's a player or like who's good, and you're like looking at the guys around you like, shit, like I could be – the next guy in that in that boat. All right, let's now go ahead and jump to the interviews with Eric Stokes Jr., cornerback of Georgia, and then Talno Hufanga, safety USC. <sighs> now joining two foreign drafts is former Georgia cornerback Eric Stokes. I, um, let me restart that. <clears throat> Three, <two, one. laughs> um, I'm overheating now. Three, two, one. Oh. <laughs> Joining two foreign drafts is now former Georgia cornerback Eric Stokes down there in Florida training with House of Athletes. Eric, great to have you on, man. Oh, no problem. No problem. It's great to be on. How's the weather down there in Florida? Cincinnati, it's not too bad. PFF is based in Cincinnati. It hasn't been terrible. How's it down there in Florida? <laughs> oh, man. Sunny shine 24-7 basically to where, like, you know, 81 degree weather right now. So, I'm man, living. out there living the dream. Where are you from? No, you're from Georgia originally, aren't you? Yeah, I'm 45 minutes from Atlanta. Gotcha, man. Very cool. Well, it's great to have you on the show. I'd love to talk more about what you're working on down there with House of Athletes. I'm sure you're training for a future Georgia Pro Day and trying to prioritize all of the drills. But are, are there any specific combine events that you're kind of like pinning on your calendar saying, hey, I got to nail this one, whether it's the 40, short shuttle, three cone. Is there anything where you're like, this is the drill for me. This is the one I got to nail? That 40. I want that 40. Like I got that pin. I got that, that 40. <laughs> In the vert, I just want to see how high can I jump really. So the so those two things I got at ten. I mean, you're a former track guy. I know you ran in high school. What uh, you had four A state titles in the hundred meter and two hundred meter. I'm sure you're you got in addition to that forty yard dash, you got a pretty low goal. You're looking to clock in the four fours, four threes. What are we thinking, Eric? I really want four threes somewhere in the four threes. But you know, if I get anywhere in four threes, I'm great. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> that's awesome man very cool um and what weight did you play at this past season and are you working towards any goal weights as you kind of prepare for that 40 yard dash uh I, typically i play that this season like around 187 188 but i really want to be like right now i really want to be 195 mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm trying my best to get up there bulking up are you eating everything you want then everything in sight or is it like a strict diet I mean, pretty much it's like I can eat whatever I want, but then again, I'm trying to get a little bit more healthy. I'm mean, yeah, healthy, so um, I'm watching more things, so like, I don't cut down on more like fast food and stuff. But I still eat, eat, eat anything I want. Dude, you're from at 45 minutes from Atlanta. There's a lot of good food in that area. Give me some of your favorites from uh, your time in Georgia. My time in Georgia now. So when I was in Athens, mm -hmm. uh, I used to wear American Deli out. Uh, if they know me, like I used to go to Mary Kelly every like at least twice a week, maybe even three. Uh, I go Chip Fil A, I go to Waffle House. You know, Waffle House is George special. Dude, and, Waffle uh, House. I've only had Waffle House once, and it was when I was at the Senior Bowl in Mobile. And how you do not leave Waffle House feeling good about yourself? Okay, you leave there just <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I just ate like like food version of sin. It's just insane. But what was your <laughs> what was your uh, sandwich order at the deli? At the deli, at American Deli. So American Deli is like a wean shop. Oh, really? So, and, yeah, American Deli is like a wean shop. So like, I go there and get me the ten or fifteen piece, and then I get two drinks, and then like my 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 wean flavor will be teriyaki, 
sprinkled with lemon pepper, but it has to be dried like teriyaki, so it ain't wet or anything. So, yeah, Dude, that sounds yeah. incredible. I fucking love wings, man. Wings are so damn good. <laughs> oh, you get me hungry now. Um, what else? I was going to mention something else on the food side of things. I remember talking to Akeem Davis Gaither, former App State linebacker, got drafted this past year, and he was the guy that had to bulk up. A lot of teams wanted him to add weight. He said he was eating like 6,000 calories a day, dude. I, I, I don't want to ever be in that situation. That's a ton of a ton of weight to be eating for sure. You kind of have to eat a lot of wings for that. Um, moving on from that, I want to – Turn turn back the clocks a little bit, not spend the entire interview on food, but it, it, more about your, <laughs> your your recruiting background. Former three star recruit, obviously, like you said, from you know forty five minutes outside of Georgia. Um, did you always know you were going to go to Georgia? Did you always know you wanted to be a bulldog? Um, actually, I did not. Like technically, I was planning on going to Ole Miss the week of signing day until like that Monday or Tuesday. I switched over and went to, went with Georgia that Wednesday. So I thought I was going to be a rebel. From the, from the start. Wow, yeah. And then, obviously, you go to Georgia, and something, I, I, you know, we talked a little bit about this before we press play, but, you know, going to Georgia at the cornerback position, you just get a ton of experience playing press coverage, being physical at the line of scrimmage. I know Georgia corners take advantage of that contact rule after five yards. You guys hang on the guys sometimes <laughs> and, and get really physical. That's what DeAndre Baker has done, Tyson Campbell, yourself. Talk to me about the experience you had at Georgia and all that you learned playing so much press, playing so much man coverage at Georgia. Oh, man, it just allowed you to, like, stay, like, get way more comfortable with staying patient, with working on your technique and all that stuff. Because constantly, like and like you said, even if we drop in zone, we still playing press man somehow, some way. So, like, man, like press man was always could be around us. So, like, just being there and all that stuff, it just allowed you to, like, work on your technique, work on every little thing to where, like, you're not uh, panicking or pretty much anything because you're already used to it. I've been fascinated with the Georgia players that I've talked to about the practice schedule. You know, I've heard bits and pieces from different players. Azizo Jolari told me that there's this like hell day where you guys only play run defense all day or like bloodbath day, yep. something like that. Um, what are some, from a defensive backs perspective, what are some of the practice days that you highlight? Is there like a one-on-ones day? Talk me through the practice week and, and which days are your best days. Oh, uh, so like you can say like Tuesday, it's Bloody Tuesday. So Bloody That's Tuesday it. is like mostly is mostly runs where like we got team run, we got all these little running drills and all that stuff. But then you still got your seven on seven, you still got one on ones that day. But really it is uh Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday we face like we do third down and red air. So all that's just really passing and all that stuff. So like that's when like you so you get the most work then. So on Wednesdays, like, hey man, it's it's the day to tighten up because you already know that you can get all that shit. That's fantastic. One of these days, I'm gonna I'm gonna suit up and I'm gonna show up to Georgia and try and get in on a Bloody Tuesday just to see how it feels. You know, I just gotta I just gotta <laughs> give it a chance here. Just gotta give it a chance. Uh, in your time at Georgia, obviously playing the SEC, you went against some really good competition. Even there at Georgia in practice, some really top flight competition. Who are some of the guys that you recall from your career at Georgia that really gave you the most fits? Or some of the most talented receivers you've gone against at Georgia. Oh, I mean, hands down. I would have to go with George. Like, George is a freak of nature. Like, I don't know how. Like, it's just some of the things that he do that you'd be like, bro, how did you catch that? Or like, you like, bro, you you literally be right there on him. And then somehow, some way, he you know with the ball. You just like, and you just start looking around and Coach Smart will come on and say, hey, man, it was just a better catch. Like, hey, like, there's nothing more you can do with that. And you just got to live with it. And you just like, man, what the heck? So, like, every, so, like, pretty much every play, I'm out there. I'm I'm trying to go against George. I'm like, man, wait, I know for a fact he can give me the best for it. What about Dominic? Dominic Blaylock's another guy too that is just like an absolute, you know, insane piece there. And also the 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 freshman tight end, the the um, what's his name? Uh, Darnell Washington. Yeah, that guy. Is, that guy. Uh, I mean, George Pickens, Darnell Washington, Blaylock. Like they have a lot of talent. Some big dudes too. You're going against some big ass guys every single practice. Yeah, yeah. So like, especially like Big O, like Big O, he just give you size wise. Cause like I remember like I had him from the line, but then after that he just boxed me out, and I'm just like, hey, coach, like I don't know how much you you want me to do for that. Like I said, like hey, pretty much, like, he just boxed me out. The only thing and the only thing I can do is make the tackle. So, so some other teams too. So outside of Georgia, you know, going against Alabama and the you know, the receivers they've had over the past few years, who are some guys that weren't on Georgia that kind of gave you some gave you fits? Um, 
Van, especially Van Jefferson from Florida, that of uh, twenty that twenty nineteen year, he was definitely like a problem in Anthony, especially like this year with Water and Smith. Like they like I mean like they gave everybody problems. So like just going against them, it really did like elevated your game. From you know from PFF's perspective, the biggest you know highlight or strength in your game, from our opinion, is is your ability to play press, is your experience in press coverage. Do you feel like that experience you had at Georgia playing as much press, what is like the key separator for you, or what do you feel like is like your biggest strength and what separates you in this cornerback class? I really believe it's my press man because like that's the one thing I hold on to. To where like I like to mess you up from the start. To where like I know for a fact if I mess you up from the start, it mess up everything because I know that you down for time and like you and the quarterback got a timing route. So like if I can mess you up from the start, it mess up the whole time and to where like everything else is messed up. So I love my press work. I, so it is what it is after that. And, and what do you think is kind of the hardest? part of the you know playing cornerback in that transition from college to the NFL. I personally think playing corner in college and then jumping to the NFL is one of the hardest leaps. It's compared to other positions and it's very difficult to adjust to the speed and the talent level of NFL wide receivers, you know, full stop. What do you feel like is the hardest part of that transition? Is it the speed? Is it, you know, the no contact rule after 5 yards? Is it kind of more, you know, more defensive penalties and those things? What do you feel like is that hard transition? It's, I mean, to me, it's like pretty much it's like what you said, like that no contact after five yards to where like that's going to play a big role to where like usually I get used to like then, okay, then like I can't, like I pretty much can't do this and I can't do that. And then especially like the PI rules where like in college it's 15 mm -hmm. or, or or whatever, but in NFL, they, it's it's a spot ball foul. I mean, a spot ball foul. So like pretty much like you could be 30 yards downfield and you don't do something, boom, that ball could be moved 30 yards. So it's like little things like that. So we're like, you got to get just to it. And then after that, of course, speed and all that stuff. So like where you're just a newcomer and everybody else been in here and doing all this stuff. So they know the game. So like usually I get used to it. Yeah, I mean, they do not protect NFL cornerbacks, man. It's it's hard <laughs> to play NFL cornerback. Um, walk me through, you know, we talked a little bit about practicing at Georgia, but walk me through in a given game week how much film you're watching of an opposing wide receiver and what you're looking for on film in that week. Oh, man, like I watch film Monday through like pretty much Monday through Thursday. So like um, on Monday, I'm just trying to break down like who are they, like wide receivers are, like pretty much like what are some of the things they do and all that. And then Tuesday – it's more like team run type of day, so like it's more run. So I'm still like just breaking down like the wide receivers to where like I'm trying to see like what type of routes they like to run, what how they pretty much how they release, or like what pretty much things they do at the top of their routes, or like even if they look for ball, like like but are they a push off? Are they more so like I'm just gonna body you or but? And then on, on Wednesdays, I pretty much just watch third down and red air to where like I know what you like to do on third down, I know what you like to do in the red air and pretty much still, like, the movements and all that stuff. And then third down, I mean, and then on Thursday, I just pretty much just clean it all. I just pretty much watch the game or whatever, like, pretty much one of the best games that they done had, like, I mean, as a team. And then I just break it down from there. And, and how does that film study change in the off season? What are you watching now on film? Is it watching yourself or is it watching guys in the NFL? Oh, pretty much. I'm just self-examining my own self. So, like, I just like to go back and just look at the growth you know, stuff that I've made, some little improvements that I can make for the off season, some things that I need to work on, and all that stuff. So I go back and watch my own film and just see how can I improve for myself. Are there any guys in the NFL that you watch a lot of, or you feel like you can like kind of emulate emulate your game after? Oh, uh, Stephen Gilmore, of course, because like um he's high, physical. High IQ. <laughs> Very physical too, and then his IQ is amazing. So like he pretty much knows like what the what the wide receiver finna do, and like so he already prepared. And then plus he's a very press man corner too, so he likes to get in your face, like the um mess sure from the line from the line of scrimmage. So I try my best to watch anything that he does. I mean, I was talking to – I'm glad you brought up IQ with Stephon Gilmore because I do feel like Stephon Gilmore is someone that a lot of young cornerbacks look up to. And I was talking to a Patriots beat writer that has followed the team for a while and said there isn't a smarter player on that team than Stephon Gilmore. That guy is committed to his craft. That guy watches more film than probably anybody on that team, a very smart player, that's for sure. Let's finish with this one, man. I got to hear about your relationship with Tyson Campbell. I mean, you one of the better – cornerback tandems in college football purely from a you know ability standpoint how competitive were you guys in practice and how much did you guys you know build off each other in your time at georgia 
Oh man, like we we bit off each other a lot. So like, if I did something wrong, he would he would coach me up, and after that, if he did something wrong, I would coach him up. And after that, and then pretty much it would be like, if we made a play, we turn up regardless. Like man, what, we ran out on the field, we doing this, we doing that. So like, that was my brother, and like it's just like a true love. So like, where I already know like ain't nothing to break us apart. So like, cause like we don't already built this like this relationship for the past three years and all this stuff. We and we just want to see each other shine. Absolutely, man. Well, I really appreciate you uh, jumping on the podcast, and I wish you the best of luck moving forward. I appreciate it. Now joining the 241 Drafts podcast is former USC safety Talanoa Hufanga. I'm pronouncing that right. I pride myself on being able to pronounce that right. Did I get that one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You did. Cool, man. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you on. I had your cousin on the podcast, I think, a few weeks ago, Marlon Tui Pelotu, and he spoke spoke highly of your praises, man. He loved playing with you there at USC. But I know right now you are in my former hometown, my former stomping grounds in San Diego, training with former USC, former NFL safety Troy Palomalu. Talk to me about that. Yeah, it's just a, a, a blessing in disguise. It's just a, something that just happened, and I'm, you know, God has blessed me with a the ability just to be able to play football. And for me, I just wanted to use those talents to uh, build a platform around me and uh, being able to come in contact with, uh, with a guy like that is just, it's, a, it's an honor. So I uh, just trying to make the most of my opportunities and, and continue to be the best uh, individual I can possibly be. Troy Palomalu, I feel like from what I remember about his game, so instinctive, you know, play recognition, smarts, football IQ. I'm sure you are watching a ton of film with Troy Palomalu. Talk to me a little bit about how that process has been and how much you've learned from Troy Palomalu already about that part of the game, being smart on the football field, being instinctive in those things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as much as it's, it's on the field, it's it's a lot that has to do with it off the field. I think just becoming a better person, uh, changing your character around and, and being obedient to, you know, the things that we do on an everyday basis. Uh, that's what helps you be a better football player. And for me, it's just uh, I've seen a lot of tremendous growth uh, within the system of just understanding coverages and the ability to disguise and and little things. We, even though I'm not even on the field playing right now, you know, I, I can learn those things. But it all starts with being to be able to humble yourself and to, and to uh, be able to learn those things at a high level. Uh, so it's just been a it's been a blessing, though, for sure. Let, let's look back now at your, you know, your career at USC and, and all the success that you did have there. I think something that stands out for me, and I think you're going to get this question a lot, is that or this feedback a lot, is that you're a big hitter. And when you play up close to the line of scrimmage, play in the box, you, 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 you play with violence, you play with a mean streak. Where do you think that resonates? And do you feel like that's a strength in your game? Do you think that separates you in the safety class? Uh, to be honest, you know, I think I have a lot of uh, weaknesses that just got to become my strengths. I don't really necessarily think I have a strength. I think I have a lot of weaknesses that can improve to be my whole game. Uh, but necessarily, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about being the best uh, player in the draft because I think I'm the best individual that I can be. I can be the best version of myself uh, at this moment. So uh, for me, it's just it's just a blessing to, to, continue, to continue to grind each and every day. Uh, I think that adds versatility to my game. You know, a, a quote that I, I've heard a lot of, you know, NFL teams use is they like big guys that can run and little guys that can hit. So uh, just trying to be the best best person and in, in, in player in that way, uh, even though I am a, a versatile athlete that can play corner, that can play slot, nickel, you know, that can play safety, field safety, and linebacker as well. And if you tell me to come up to the line and be an edge rusher, I can be an edge rusher. So uh, when you try to put that versatility on the field, you, you try to utilize that and – in the most accurate way possible. So, <laughs> yeah, no, l let's talk more about that versatility because I do think that's another part of your game where, you know, you could play up in the box, you could play, you know, a, a strong safety slot position up on the line of scrimmage, rushing the passer. Do you have you received any feedback from teams you've talked to so far about where they want to play you? Or do you feel like right now you're viewed as this chess piece that can do anything? Uh, to be honest, I think I view it as more of a chess piece that can just be used around. But my goal is to be. The best player I, I don't really want to have a label on me whether it's uh, a free safety or a corner necessarily but you you give me great coaches you know i'm gonna be a, i'm a great student so for me i just want to be the best player and be coachable enough to to learn a system and, and be able to utilize it from day one whether it's on special teams uh you know i think a goal of mine would be a special teams pro bowler as as a rookie you know so for me it's just coming out here and just doing the best best job i possibly can each and every day 
Uh, I, can we talk a little bit more, too, about um, you know the injuries that you've suffered? I think you what, broke two collarbones at USC. I'm sure that you learned a lot in the rehab process, learned a lot in having to battle back from injuries. I talked to Rondale Moore, who's a Purdue wide receiver who has battled two grade one hamstring injuries and, and constantly gets asked you know questions or docked in the scouting process about his injury history. How, how much of a struggle was it for you to like not be on the football field and battle through those injuries? And what do you think you learned from that experience? Well, it opens your eyes to a whole different different part of, of football. You know, that's that's a football away from being on the field. Uh, so just understanding, you know, there's a process to it, and there's there's time that it takes to to really heal. And uh, for me, it was just a it was a a true testament to my character and what I can do off the field. And for me, it was just being obedient. Like I said earlier on, you just got to be obedient in what we do on a day to day basis. It it will, it will teach you a lot through your your own eyes, just the way you handle things for sure. In a given game week, what exactly are you looking for on film when you're studying opposing offense and preparing for an opposing offense? Uh, you're just trying to, you know, find your keys. You know, there's different keys to each team. There's a game plan for each team. You know, whether, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to be on a team where we move, were able to move a lot of people around. And when you go against different teams, they run 11, 12, 10 personnel sets. We're able to, you know, scout correctly and game plan correctly, which can move you around. So, I think the ultimate goal is just to be flexible in a sense that, you know, there was a game that I played linebacker this year, uh, you know, and if I had to play corner this year, I would, you know, it's more or less just where, wherever they need me, that's where I got to play and, and do my best uh, in that, in that role. And so each early on in the week, you just got to find those keys and find the game plan scouting report and be able to, you know, uh, kind of do it correctly on game day in a sense. So, <laughs> And what has been your film film preparation now in the off season? Are you watching a ton of film with Troy and, and are you watching any film on yourself or even NFL players, maybe watching a ton of Troy Palomalo's film? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy that just loves to stick to the script in the sense of, you know, I'm just trying to enhance my body mentally, physically, emotionally, and just go out there and, and continue to grind in each way possible, whether it's watching film, whether it's learning new defenses, whether it's studying the past, you know, I've, I've, I've had two different defense corners and you got to understand each kind of concepts when it comes to film. Cause you know, when you're breaking down film with the NFL coach, you gotta, you, anything can happen. So uh, for me, it's just understanding every play and, and concept wise, but uh, most importantly, it's just, you know, I, I like to watch a little, I'm more of a little bit older type of, you know, football player when it's since I like to watch, you know, Troy, Ed Reed, uh, Rodney Harrison, you know, I like, you know, I got to, I got to watch those guys that have high end motors that really ball hockey people that can just go out there and, and play on a consistent basis as well. So, and do you feel like some of those guys are who you want to model your game after? Do you think like, do you see Troy Palomalo as a big role model, a guy that you know consistently made plays, you know, with his mind, consistently made plays in the box? Yeah. So for me, it's just more or less just you know, I'm my own person. Uh, but at the end of the day, you you take your game from a lot of other people and you make it your own. You know, if I could have the ability to have Ed Reed's post work, you know, that'd be the game that I would bring in. You know, the ability to disguise coverages like Troy, I'd bring that into my game. Uh, the ability to bring a cut tackling in like Bob Sanders, you know, that's that's something I bring into mind. And, and a motor like Mr. Harrison over at the, you know, the Chargers and, and, and the New England. When you put all those things into my game, that's what I should, what I should be working towards to be the best at. So uh, it's just the overall version of those guys. It's just a blessing to learn from for sure. Absolutely, man. Well, I really appreciate you setting aside the time and, and jumping on the podcast with me, and I wish you the best of luck moving forward. No worries. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. That's going to do it for this edition of 2 for 1 Drafts. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to 2 for 1 Drafts. Leave a five-star review for our upcoming mailbag. Yes, we're behind. Yes, we have 100 questions on the books, but we're going to continue to answer questions for the mailbag. Leave a five-star review and drop your question in there. Until next time, Austin Gale, producer Mike Quinn is back. Mike Renner, 2 for 1 Drafts.